evening and welcome to the show. I am Rodrigo Diaz and this is the OBG Corner in partnership with ANC News. Our guest tonight is Daniel Ventanilia. He is the general manager of NYK Phil Japan Shipping Corporation, a joint venture between NYK Line of Japan, one of the world's largest shipping companies and part of the Mitsubishi Group, and the Transnational Diversified Group, a Philippine-based business conglomerate engaged in diversified industries across Asia, where he also serves as a deputy president for the logistics division. Daniel has headed NYK for over two decades, and it is our pleasure that he's here with us tonight. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. My thank pleasure. For, thank you for coming. And 2014 uh, was a very challenging time for the shipping and logistics industry here in the Philippines. Uh, the daytime truck ban, of course, implemented by the city government of Manila, mm -hmm. uh, which created a domino effect of uh, port congestion, uh, truck surcharges, uh, and an overall economic uh, slowdown when it comes to trade. Uh, looking at one of the direct offshoots of what happened in the aftermath after the truck ban was lifted, uh, and of course the backlog, backlog that was generated uh, in the month after as it reached the uh, Christmas uh, peak season. Uh, looking at some of the, the main offshoot, which is the executive order from the president, uh, mm -hmm. trying to uh, naming both Subic and Batangas as extensions to the Manila port, and to what extent have they served to alleviate port congestion, and what sort of system has been put in place to ensure that this is a sustainable uh, scenario, and not just you know an, an offshoot um, as a result of the port, of the immediate port congestion. Uh, what sort of developments have been generated in that respect? Ah, okay. The port congestion, in a way, has been an eye-opener for the industry. Not only the industry, but for the country. Well, uh, Manila Port handles over 75% of all container traffic going in and out of the Philippines. And that has been remained, that's the fact. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it has been like that, not only in the last decades, but even in centuries. Because Manila is a primary gateway even during the Spanish era of uh, Manila, Acapulco, and the Galleon trade. So Manila as a location is very critical, not only for the country but even Asia. The problem was, uh, much as the development of container traffic has grown, the road, has, uh, had, the road network had little development at all, or almost none. Okay? So that is what has happened, uh, especially during 2014 and a direct effect was the congestion. Now, what the government was trying to do is uh, they are trying to, even the government partnered with Japan to develop alternative ports mm -hmm. close to Manila. And that's when uh, Batangas Port in the south and Subic Port in the no north was established. Now, based on our earlier studies, even prior to congestion, a huge number of goods are really destined south and north of Manila. But at the end of the day, prior to the congestion, everything goes to Manila. Right. So uh, if we could uh, divert some of this traffic, not intended for Metro Manila, then it can easily alleviate the goods. And you know, during the port congestion, the utilization of both ports had dramatically increased. Mm -hmm. That's a good effect. So uh, in a way, the port congestion uh, opened up a lot of things uh, for the country. Okay. And has there been any sort of support infrastructure or any other developments that have been done to ensure that this is more of a sustainable long-term solution and not just you know, an immediate aftermath of the uh, port congestion that was facing the Port of Manila? Yeah, uh, more or less, uh, actually uh, right now, considering uh, Manila will be a major traffic, we need to come up uh, with uh, things that can complement the three ports, Manila, Subic and Batangas. Mm -hmm. So continue will, uh, economy will continue to grow, okay? So uh, exponential growth in traffic. So uh, some support infrastructure which are needed to uh, sustain this development is, uh, well, for one, it's the physical infrastructure. One is the development of the road network, as I mentioned earlier. So for the physical infrastructure, I think that Aquino administration had addressed this one. Projects like the NLEX, SLEX connector, the NLEX harbor link. Once those things are done in a year or so, it will connect the Manila port to north and south of the uh, Metro Manila. Okay. And it will also connect within Metro Manila because the NLEX connector goes to it. Mm -hmm. The only uh, challenge is we, ne we need to be vigilant that these projects get to be done because it, there will be a transition of administration. And the other thing beyond the physical is the process or the software infrastructure. Mm -hmm. One is uh, 
the Bureau of Customs need to be computerized. That's for one. And it has to be uh, uh, fixed immediately. And the other software infrastructure is, th the reason why I said on the Bureau of Customs is so that information between Philippine ports can be very uh, easy mm -hmm. or seamless. And the other thing is the local laws, which we need to uh, make a good study. Because uh, sometimes uh, here in the Philippines, uh, we have laws which prevent goods or trucks to ply the road 24 by 7. Right. It is totally different in other countries. We have noticed highly urbanized countries where the port is near to the populated area, mm -hmm. but still things are moving. So there are things like we are studying in the industry like vehicle booking system, a system that is being done in, uh, let's say, Australia, which can be tweaked a little and adapt to the Philippine roads. So in a way, these things can uh, help uh, uh, move a lot of our traffic. The only thing that we need to uh, also look at is uh, uh, Philippines, okay? Because uh, when we see an, a container truck on the road, mm -hmm. most of us and even some of my staff would say it's an eyesore for traffic. So what we really want to, to do is if we can improve our traffic flow system, we can make sure that these uh, trucks are not really an eyesore, an eyesore, but more of an engine to move goods and engines to move economy. So that is uh, how we should really put our mindset into this. And I think uh, the port congestion was uh, something uh, enlightened everybody on that. Right. Now, I mean, looking, of course, at the, the port, uh, the main gateway of the country, the Port of mm -hmm. Manila, the two international ports, uh, it's been growing consistently for the past 20 years. And, of course, the access road has remained the same uh, on the physical infrastructure side. Uh, another development on technology infrastructure, the potential of the um, national single window and, put, you know, migrating into even the ASEAN single window and mm -hmm. what sort of developments have been generated on that side and what, how, what sort of impact would it have in alleviating congestion and also just making... Um, uh, cargo import and exports more seamless? Mm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on the software infrastructure, like for the Bureau of Customs, I think uh, uh, they are into the process of making things uh, computerized, of course. But I think uh, we still need to push it uh, a bit further. Uh, we have economies uh, in terms of uh, our Philippine container volume. Mm -hmm. is much, much smaller if we compare it to Singapore, Hong Kong, or even Japan. But despite the vo their volume, they have a more uh, systematic way of handling information through customs. Mm -hmm. So what we can really do is just uh, look into that very strongly. Philippines as a country have a very stronger government will to implement it so that uh, we can easily integrate all the Philippine ports. Information will be the same in real time anywhere and any place. Mm -hmm. And then integration with the ASEAN, which is uh, the na our national single window integrating with ASEAN, will be much easier. And if it's needed tomorrow, then it can easily be done. But we have to get our act together on getting that computerized done. Right. And to add, uh, knowing Bureau of Cost BOC is one of the major revenue drivers of our government, mm -hmm. which is a growing economy, I think we have more than enough resources to buy the computer system. Looking at other developments that have been uh, created in only in the past couple of weeks, uh, the amendments to the cabotage law and the mm. expected repercussions that it has or the positive developments that it can generate for inter-island shipping uh, and the lowering of costs and making overall shipping more efficient in the country and what sort of expectations are there surrounding mm. the amendments? Yeah, actually I would want to say that uh, the cabotage, it was not really cabotage law. The Philippine president signed the co-loading agreement or the co-loading law. Mm -hmm. uh, to define it, it uh, makes uh, foreign container ships, initially it's for foreign container traffic, foreign container ships will be allowed to bring their boxes, the, con the foreign container boxes, mm -hmm. 
in and out, import and export, laden and empty, in between Philippine ports. So it makes things efficient. Mm -hmm. For one, if you're an exporter or importer, it will be easier for you to transact uh, how to bring a good, not only in Manila, but to other ports in the Philippines. And the other thing is, uh, because Manila has been a, a major transshipment hub for other Philippine ports, uh, the real situation happening today is when a container or a foreign container box comes into Manila, it goes from the Manila International Port to the Manila Domestic Port. And that one you have to grow through the small roads of Manila. So that will be, in a way, eliminated with this uh, uh, impending law, which the implementing guidelines are being made. Mm -hmm. So normally we use the small domestic ships, which as of today is full of domestic cargo because domestic trade has been growing. So we are into that challenge, uh, how to move boxes around in between Manila. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, uh, as to elaborate further, Philippines as an economy, we are three boxes in, almost, uh, we are an importing economy mm -hmm. rather than export. So let's say ports or areas like Manila and Cebu, we are more imports than export. So like Manila, three boxes in, only one box going out for export. So there are other areas in the country which are export oriented, mm -hmm. like Mindanao and Subic. By doing this co-loading law, it will be easier for us to transfer or logistically transfer empties or whatever to other to these areas which we need it for export mm -hmm. and it makes things efficient for the country and the good thing of it is uh, once that is done the good the effect is the domestic shipping companies can uh, easily focus on uh, the domestic cargo and uh, it will give them uh, more opportunity to invest on bigger ships mm -hmm. and uh, also, uh, big ships, more efficient, will translate uh, for savings for the average Filipino consumer. And the only thing is this co-loading law really complements the essence of the cabotage law, which is to protect Philippine businesses. You mentioned the, um, the issue, of course, of the MTs, the trading balance, and to what extent has mm. that been addressed in the aftermath of the truck ban? Uh, there is an inland uh, container uh, terminal that has been built on the private sector side, but just the, the managing of the empties and what role has it played in also addressing congestion? Ah, okay. So right now, before, considering the country is uh, three in, one out, we have to handle almost two empties. And normally they get shipped out of the country. Right. So what we have done is uh, there are government rules which were created that empties should be handled much faster, which is good. And then uh, the creation of the inland container terminal, which as of this time is continued to be being built. Mm -hmm. it, it has already opened, but we need to build the area for, it's close to 21 hectares. So it's located south of uh, Manila in Calamba, Laguna. Mm -hmm. So this one will, in a way, ensure that containers don't get stuck in our Manila ports. Mm -hmm. It gets to be uh, done in another place. And this concept is not actually new in the in worldwide. It is being done in Thailand, Japan, Taiwan, and even in India, mm -hmm. where there is a huge population. So we need to find a flow of container traffic, not only on the seaports, considering Philippines is a, an archipelago, mm -hmm. but in big islands like Luzon, we need to find a solution how to make the container flow despite some landlocked areas, mm -hmm. like Laguna. And considering the archipelagic nature of the, uh, of the mm -hmm. country, and a lot of the economic activity decentralizing into second-tier cities, uh, you know, into the provincial areas, mm -hmm. uh, there hasn't been a centralized roadmap when it comes to port infrastructure, or a rationalization of which areas should be prioritized. Uh, mm -hmm. Has there been any developments, or even looking at you know, the areas, the geographic areas of the country that are generating most growth, and what sort of port infrastructure need to be prioritized, and how are developers being encouraged to invest into that? Uh, okay. I, I think uh, for shipping, it's a very basic business. Mm -hmm. We go where there is the cargo. So it's easy to develop any port as long as the ship can come. Right. Now, uh, I think uh, one of the things that we need to address is the consistency of policies within the government 
because uh, I remember from the previous administration, we were trying to connect everything via Roro, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, that has practically changed during uh, the current administration. So right now, what we are trying to do is uh, the economy will continue to grow. That's for one, and that's a given. So traffic will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Now we just need to point it in the right ports. And like today, we're trying to consistently point it to Subic and Batangas. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to get our act together. And I think uh, the recent private developments together with some government support, we are already trying to develop more traffic through Subic, which in a way is helping Manila mm -hmm. today. So uh, I think uh, it's more on the cons consistency on which things to develop. So today, we are in that direction. Mm. I mean, even addressing, I mean, talking about inter-island shipping configurations, mm. the fact that it is more expensive to ship from Davao into the main mar domestic market, which is Luzon, than to international markets. And uh, there has been discussions, of course, to have some spokes model and infrastructure that would need to be taken into account to complement that sort of configuration uh, or any other area that would cre create that efficiency and lowering of costs when it comes to inter-island shipping. Mm, okay. Yeah, for inter-island shipping, they have, uh, like, domestic shipping has a major challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we go with what the customers want. So you would notice the ships domestically, what we operate are around 250 to less than 1,000 TEU ships. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, those ships are actually in the global level are very small ships. And uh, it, takes, uh, it takes them uh, a huge amount just to operate these things. So what we're trying to do is uh, if uh, we can uh, have the domestic shipping focus to moderni mod modernize themselves, let's say uh, focus on the domestic cargo, don't worry with the foreign container boxes, mm -hmm. then I think they have a chance to make things more efficient uh, domestically. Uh, technology is available there in the globally, so they can easily tap into that. Right. And I mean, in terms of how does the Philippines fit within ASEAN, the, the 10 member bloc, and mm -hmm. what sort of air tra uh, sea transport infrastructure would complement its connectivity with the, the wider regional bloc, uh, especially considering you know, the increase of trade and the ongoing liberalization efforts, and what steps have been done on that, uh, on that direction? Ah, okay. Um, well, ASEAN, uh, we always hear it in the news uh, more recently, but actually in shipping, it has been happening for more than a decade already. Mm -hmm. So uh, the country continues to grow and the uh, Philippines as a market to ASEAN is very critical. Our country is growing not only economically but as uh, population grows almost close to 2% annually, we are a market mm -hmm. for ASEAN. And there are a lot of uh, things going into the Philippines. And the other thing is, uh, we are much as we are in the midst of ASEAN, we're very much close to China, Japan, and uh, even Taiwan and Korea. Mm -hmm. And it's even made closer by the shipping routes we create. And if you look into the western side of the Philippines, we're actually one of the gateways to the Trans-Pacific. So our position is strategic, and that has been proven by history, as I mentioned er earlier during the Spanish area mm -hmm. on the galleon trade. But the only thing that uh, we need to get together is we're fully focus on the Manila port as of this time. As NYK actually, uh, we are trying to revolutionize the way international shipping is made. In the Manila port, we bring this 3,000 to 4,000 tier ships. Mm -hmm. They're massive when you look at it as a Filipino in a Manila port. Right. But they're strikingly small because we have ships four times bigger than that mm -hmm. operating globally. So the only port that can handle that is Subic as of today. So we need to get this thing together in Subic so we can handle more goods using bigger ships to a major port. And we can use the co-loading law to transfer as many uh, goods around the, the island. Right. The only thing is, uh, uh, the other thing that uh, we have been successful in doing it for NYK for a long time, let's say for the transport of cars. Mm -hmm. We made Batangas as a major hub for cars. And that's why you've seen the cars have been growing uh, almost a double digit every year in right. terms of, and the market has more options. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it through Batangas. So the ships are there, technology is available worldwide. The Filipino is more than capable 
we can we are capable in handling these technologies or innovation mm -hmm. we have seafarers operating the most complicated ships worldwide the only thing is the consistency in the government the policies, policies which we need daniel thank you very much i expect this is not the last time we'll have you on the show and thank you again for joining us thank you very much yeah um this has been the obg corner i'm rodrigo diaz thank you for watching Thank you.